Welcome to Be Still My Soul. Today, my beautiful sisters, Marky Avla, Alva Belayla, and myself, Pauline Romero, will be looking at Job chapter 19. And we invite you right now to join us for our opening prayers. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for all you do for us. And we ask right now, Lord, that you send down the Holy Spirit to guide us, to give us that word, that revelation. Help us to know and understand your will, Lord, and what you want us to receive today. O oh, Holy Spirit, soul of my soul, we worship and adore you, enlighten and guide, strengthen and console us, tell us what we ought to do and command us to do it. We promise to be submissive in everything you permit to happen to us. Only show us what is your will. Amen. Amen. The unity prayer. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Amen. The Family Prayer Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, in you we contemplate the splendor of true love. To you we turn with trust. Holy Family of Nazareth, Grant that our families, too, may be places of communion and prayer, authentic schools of the gospel, and small domestic churches. Holy Family of Nazareth, may families never ex again experience violence, rejection, and division. May all who have been hurt or scandalized find ready comfort and healing. Holy Family of Nazareth, Make us once more mindful of the sacredness and inviolability of the family and its beauty in God's plan. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, graciously hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us for the opening prayer. We now go to Marky for Job 19. Thank you, uh -oh. Pauline. <laughs> Job's fifth reply. Then Job answered and said, How long will you vex my soul? Grind me down with words. These ten times you have reviled me, have assailed me without shame. Be it indeed that I am at fault, and that my fault remains with me. Even so, if you would vaunt yourselves against me, and cast up to me my reproach. Know then that God has dealt unfairly with me, and compassed me round with his net. If I cry out, in justice, I am not heard. I cry for help, but there is no redress. He has barred my way, and I cannot pass. He has veiled my path in darkness and taken the di diadem from my brow. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone. My hope he has uprooted like a tree. His wrath he has kindled against me. He counts me among his enemies. His troops advance as one man. They build up their road to attack me, and they encamp around my tent. He has distanced me from my brothers, completely estranged me from my friends. My kinsfolk and companions have gone away. My guests have forsaken me. My maidservants count me as an alien, as if they had never known me. I summon my servant, but he does not answer. Even when I plead with him, to my wife, my breath is offensive. 
To my own brothers, I am loathsome. Even little children ridicule me. Come, let us make fun of him. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love has tur have turned against me. I have become skin and bone and have escaped with only my gums. Pity me, pity me, you my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me like God and pray insatiably upon me? Oh, would that my words were written down. Would that that they were inscribed in a record. That with an iron chisel and with lead they were cut in the rock forever. As for me, I know that my vindicator lives and that he will at last stand forth upon the dust. This will happen when my skin has been stripped off, and from my flesh I will see God. I will see from myself my own eyes, not another's, will behold him. My inmost being is con consumed with longing. But you who say, how shall we perse persecute him, seeing that the root of the mother is found in him? Be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for your anger is a crime deserving the sword, that you may know that there is a judgment. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We now prayerfully go back and read Job chapter 19, so that we can determine and discern what the Holy Spirit is telling us. And when we return, we will share these reflections with you on Be Still, my soul.
Welcome back to Be Still My Soul. We're looking at Job chapter 19. And I'm thinking, ladies, Lord, when is this going to end? <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of suffering. Um, and it gets very personal, too. Yes. Okay, Alba, I think you're ready to go, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Marky. Ready as in ready. Mm. Every time I say I'm not, but I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Job. I still, I'm still feeling for him. Um, his reply to Bildad's um, and second speech. And um, I feel like he still continues to accuse his friends of not being supportive of him, of not, being, of not having sympathy for what he's going through. His friends do not know what he really is going through because it's not them. It's just like we do not know. We may know, oh, someone is not feeling well or someone is going through things, but we do not know what necessarily that person is going through because it's not us. So um, Job is telling um, Bildad, how long will you afflict my spirit, Grammy, with, down with words? And um, on chapter 16, Job, Job told, um, Job said, they're troublesome comforters. Mm -hmm. They have not been comforting him the way he would want to. And we hear, and I've, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, we sometimes do the same. We do not know how to comfort our friends because we do not know. We think we're saying the right things, but we're not. And sometimes instead of making things better, we make it worse. Because we might say the wrong thing, not what the person wants to hear when he or she is going through things. Or we do things that, the, that affects the person negatively instead of positively. So here I am seeing that Job is feeling the same way. Their words and their actions are not helping him. Instead of comforting him, they're making him feel worse. And they are his good friends. They have been there for him. We know they were there for him when he, for seven days, stood there listening to him when he lost everything, his family, his wealth. But now he feels that, you know, you are just bashing at me. Comfort me. I need to hear things. And he even says it, pity me, pity me. <coughs> but they, they cannot do, in my opinion, they cannot do that because they do not know exactly how he's feeling. Because it's not them. Unless it was one of them, they will understand, that person will understand what Job is going through. And it's like he, he feels that his friends are not his friends. They're just there to accuse him that he's a sinful man. But we know that he's not. And um, like I said, I feel for him because he feels that everyone despises him. He says, he says it, even the young children despise me. In verse, in verse 17, my breath is a burden to my wife. He said his wife doesn't want him. 
his wife who is supposed to be there for him unconditionally and here on earth how many wives and how many husbands have felt that way as well that their spouses the feel their spouses are not there for them they don't want to be with them so job is is really going through a lot I do not know how long he will go through this. I, I just feel for him. <laughs> the pain of losing everything and now feeling that the ones he thought he could count on are not there for him. But one thing on, on verse 25, um, he says, as for me, I know that my vindicator lives and that he will at last stand forth upon the dust. He at least still knows that his God lives and will one day take him out of his mis misery. It will, his misery will end. He does not know exactly which day. But he knows, he trusts God that this will end. God will make it end, regardless of what other people say. And um, verse 27, I will see for myself, my own eyes, not another's, will behold him. My inmost being is consumed with longing. I... I I believe that he has this, even though he's in this darkness, he has this boldness and this faith that, that, is, that God is there for him. He's always there for him. And God is not punishing him because he's sinful. Because we know that he has always been faithful to his God regardless of what he's been through. And I think in this verse, Satan, the devil, is not happy. <laughs> because Job still has faith in his God. Is still not giving it's not it's still not falling into temptation of doing what the enemy wants. Mm -hmm. And we we need to practice that in our daily lives. That when we're going through something, if either small or big things, we have to have the faith and the hope that God will take us out of this. And will take us out of it stronger than before. And I am sure Job will come out stronger than before. Even though I, I would want to read, <laughs> the continue reading, but then I'm like, nah. <laughs> but I am sure he will come out stronger. And we as well, through our trials and tribulations, once we have faith, and the Lord will too. Amen. And that is my share for today. Thank you. Powerful sharing, Alva. Thank we'll you. be right back to hear more on Be Still, My Soul. Welcome back to Be Still My Soul. We're looking at Job chapter 19, and you did quite a powerful sharing, Alva. Thank you, Pam. And it's very important because um, I went through this chapter and I was really stretched thin trying to find something positive in this chapter to speak about. And I mean, I was really stretching it because it's so negative. It's Job's fifth response, and he's really struggling. 
And, uh, um, you know, I am at a place where I can really identify with him right now. And I was really searching for what's the positive word in this chapter today versus 13 to 22, more or less, actually, some of what I read, um, speaks of a hopeless situation, you know? Um, people who are dearest to you, your family, your, your espoused, your servants, everybody has turned their back on you and you're really like a laughing stock. You have been removed from your royal throne, <laughs> throne if you want to put it, you know? You're really struggling to maybe even stay alive. And this is, this is, I can so identify with this particular situation, you know? People who are sick, who are hopelessly sick, who have a, an illness that they have been told there's no cure from this. Um, people who are old and lonely and, and maybe people who are homeless, you know? People who are struggling financially and everywhere they turn, it's just like all the doors seem to be closing on them. Um, there just seems no hope that men just walk away or, or whatever. And, you know, it's so important the, in verse 2. It says words. When you're faced with a situation like this, it is so important how you meet each morning. I woke up today and I said, no matter what, I'm going to make today be a good day. No matter what I'm facing, no matter what slings and arrows are coming at me, I decided to put on my helmet of salvation today. You know, that's what I did. And it speaks so powerfully to me out of Ephesians, right? Because whatever we choose to believe, we become. If we choose to believe that we're useless, if we choose to believe that no one loves us, if we choose to believe that our friends have turned their back on us, if we choose to believe that this situation is hopeless and there is no way that this can turn around. What am I going to do? I'm going to make a step into a situation where I may forever regret what I do. And, and there are people who, and you know, it's, it's very difficult when people battle with mental illness or when you have a, a moment when you snap when you feel that all is hopeless. So it's so important to keep yourself covered with the word of God every morning. And the minute we fail to do that, the arrows will come at us, especially if you're in a very trying situation. You gotta keep yourself armored. As Ephesians chapter six says, put on your armor of God and go to battle, you know? I'm studying right now this course called Armor of God and just yesterday we heard about the, hel the helmet of salvation where you cover yourself with the word of God daily so that you feed yourself that positivity, you feed your soul that positivity because it's so easy to become negative. It's so easy to give up. It's so easy to say, this is hopeless. There's no way this can turn around, right? Because that's what the devil wants us to believe. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's a thief. He's a schemer. And he will deceive us to believe these things, right? So we have to remember who we are in Christ. And that leads me to Ephesians chapter 1, right? In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says that from eternity, God destined us in love to be his adopted sons and daughters through Christ Jesus. Wow. Adopted. This means that no matter what we did in the past, no matter what mistakes we may have made, no matter what bad moves we would have made, no matter how terrible we were or are, 
God forgives, right? And we got to know who we are in Christ. Because if we don't know who we are in Christ, then we will fall to the wayside. Because sometimes the attack is not physical, it's mental. It's a mental attack we go through. The devil is real and he gets into our minds. And he plays with our minds if we allow him. So we got to clothe ourselves with the word of God. And we got to know who we are in Christ. We are in the desert right now. Right? We are going through the 40 days of Lent and we will be tempted more than ever. Jesus was tempted. And what did he tell to Satan? He gave Satan three responses whilst he was being tempted. Right? And it's very important for us to know that what Jesus went through and how he answered the devil, if I can find it. I, I had it written down now. But he gave three responses, verses 4, verse 8, and verse 12, I believe. Yes. Um, oh gosh, I can't find it. But when I find it, I will share it. But we got to know who we are in Christ. And we're adopted. We're adopted through the blood of Jesus Christ. He died for us. He gave us salvation through his son. Jesus went through everything for us. So we don't need to sacrifice now. The sacrifice has already been made through the blood of Jesus. Right? And Alva spoke of it when she took us to verse 25. Right? We got to not only know who we are in Christ, but we got to know that Jesus lives. It says in verse 25 of Job chapter 19, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he, the last, will take his stand on earth. Right? We got to clothe ourselves with this word and ground ourselves every day in the word of God so that we don't get shaky when the trials come, right? And we all have our trials that we face. I know that each one of us as we sit here right now are facing our own different trials. Nobody's life is perfect, right? Nobody's life. But if we cover ourselves with the word of God and keep our focus on him and fill our mind with positive things and choose to have a righteous attitude that no matter what, this too will pass. One day, this will not exist anymore. This situation is going to turn around. One day, I'm going to have my betrothed Love me the way God calls us to love. One day, I may die. We all have to die. But I know that one day I will no longer battle with this illness. I will no longer battle with this terrible situation I may be facing. Right? We got to allow God to speak into our minds because this is where the battle is for many of us. And it is a very, very hard place when that battle starts in your mind you might not see somebody suffering you might not understand how somebody is feeling and you said it it's in your mind so you can't tell if somebody is feeling hopeless you can't tell if somebody is feeling really at the end of their rope so we got to pray for each other We've got to pray for ourselves. We've got to put on our armor of God every day. And we've got to clothe ourselves with the word of God. We've got to put on our helmet of salvation and know who we are in Christ, that we're adopted. Now, I come from a family where I'm the only real blood child. So that word adopted means a lot to me, right? Because my parents adopted so many other children. And for a very long time, I battled with a lot of things about that. And at the end of the day, and I can openly say it here, feeling that my parents' heart wasn't big enough to love all of us. But that's not true. And that's the way it is with God. God's heart is so big, he will love all of us, even in our sinfulness. 
right? Even when we offend others, even when we are not compassionate enough, even when we are not merciful enough, he will still love us and he will speak to us as his children. He will tell us when we are going wrong, right? But we've got to allow him to speak to us, right? So when you're in a very heavy battle, it's important for you to wake early every morning and put on your, your armor, put on your helmet, get your sword ready to go to battle. Your sword is the word of God, right? Cover yourself with the precious blood of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, I go back to it, right? It says in verse 19, May you understand with what extraordinary power he acts in favor of us who believe. That's a very powerful verse. And someone ministered to me with that about a month ago. And I just accepted it. Didn't know how it would come back to help me. But yesterday, I was really, really feeling so hopeless. And I just cried out to God as I was driving, and I said, Lord, I don't know how this will all end, but you know, you know, give me hope right now. My phone rang, and it was someone giving me some hope. God always answers his children. He might not come and bring you exactly what you want, but he will bring you what you need. Never forget that. And we must always not be afraid to call out to him in whatever fashion. In Ephesians chapter 1, it goes on to say, from above all rule, power, authority, dominion, or any other supernatural force that could be named, not only in this world, but in the world to come as well. Remember, we are dealing with spiritual realms in Job. Right? Job, you could call him the victim if you want, but I choose not to call anyone a victim. We are all victors in Christ. And that is part of your mental battle. The devil will tell you you're a victim. Oh, who is me? Poor Pauline. Never. I'm a victor in Christ. I am a princess in the kingdom of Jesus. We learned that in Revive last year. And we must claim that powerfully because some of us may be in very hopeless situations right now, right? We're battling an illness. I have a friend who calls out to me every now and again in such severe pain, and I feel for her, and I can't do anything for her. But what I do is call upon my sisters to pray with me for her. And then after a little while, you hear, I feel a little better. Thank you. We don't know what people are going through. Some people ask for prayers, some don't. Some act out in anger against you in their pain. And you become the victim of their pain or their anger or their resentment. But what we must do is go into the prayer room, go into our war room and pray for our enemies. Because really these people are not really the enemies. It's the devil. And he is trying to destroy us. And so we must recognize this and ask God to help us because he will never abandon his children and we're all his children. With that, I thank you for listening to my sharing today on Be Still My Soul. And today is a very special day for me. And whilst I don't want to say publicly why, I just ask for your continued prayers for me and my family, and for each of us here today. I think we can say it publicly. <laughs> no, he's not going to be very happy. <laughs> uh, but I'll say it. Say it. <laughs> today, 21 years ago, I became a mom. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. With that, we'll be back to hear from Marky on Be Still, My Soul.
Welcome back to Be Still My Soul. We're looking at Job chapter 19, a real toughie today. <laughs> Let's hear what Marky has to say. Marky. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline and Alva. Um, I must say, your sharings both were really beautiful and um, it ho hits home. Um, so, Job is responding to all the bashing he has been getting. Um, these past few, what, how long, days, weeks? Um, <laughs> and um, he has found himself in a, a very um, awful place, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, this, chapter, this chapter here gives me hope for Job and a great respect for him. He is truly a, a, a good, wise, honorable man. He's real. And he makes me understand a lot more about life. <laughs> so we said this chapter here was very heavy because it talks about Job saying that they're, they're vexing his soul. <laughs> it says, vex my soul. You vex my soul and you grind me down with your words. And um, it says, ten times you've reviled me. You assailed me without shame. And how many times have things like that happened to people where people hurt people without shame, without care, without respect, without, they just shame you, like without remorse. And he's extremely frustrated, overwhelmed, and he's hurt by all of this. And he says, he says that... Uh, Nothing is coming his way. He's, he's not, he's shouting out injustice, he says. And he's not being heard. No one's listening to him. He's not being respected. And not only is he not being respected, but even though he cries for help, he said there is no redress. There is no ease to his pain. There is no, everything just keeps on coming. And... I think the turning point here for me was when it, it, I read where he says, he has been stripped of his glory. And he says, he breaks me down on every side and I am God. I am gone. My hope he has uprooted. Now I think at the, this part here it says about being uprooted, his hope being uprooted. And then in the ending it says here, the word, seeing that the root of the matter is found in him. And I think of the root. And I think Job is truly planted himself in God. I think Job knows his God and his God knows him. I believe that Job, despite feeling abandoned by all his closest friends, his family, his wife. Um, everyone has turned against him. He does not feel loved. He does not feel wanted. He does not feel appreciated. No one has taken pity on him. Everyone has just turned their back on him. And he keeps saying, the only one that can judge him is God but yet everyone else has judged him harshly. And he's feeling quite alone. But he says, But as for me, I know that my vindicator lives, and he will last stand forth upon the dust. And I think of the greatest gift God gave Job, and that's Jesus. And I think of that line there, thinks of our vindicator lives, Jesus lives, he died for me. So this passage here gives me much hope that makes me know that God has given me the greatest gift and that's Jesus, that he lives and, and Jesus vindicates me. He makes me, despite, and Job says, whether I'm wrong or right, my Jesus lives and he will vindicate me. He will make things right. Um... This whole passage here, it says, um, I'm sorry, verse 26 is, and, and from my flesh I shall see God, 
My inmost being is consumed with longing. I think that despite all things that are thrown against us, I think if we're truly rooted in God and we long for God, God will never leave us, never forsake us. Mm -hmm. I believe that, as it says here, He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. Sometimes we have to go through these trials. We might get beaten down, but it's in those trials that God vindicates us and we too are able to relate and help other people out there that goes through those trials. Just as Jesus went through his trials and he died for us. <laughs> but look what he did. Look at how he vindicated us. We have been saved because of that. So, Again, I just feel that if we stay the word rooted, grounded in God, continue to long for God and listen to Him, be open to Him. And right now, Job's not really feeling that, but he just knows. He believes in his God. And he still, despite being completely abandoned by everyone else, in this line in there is telling me that he truly in his hearts of hearts know that his God will not fail him and leave him. He may not feel God's presence. He may not see God's presence. Mm -hmm. But he just knows. Why? Because throughout the years, he has established a relationship with his God. He has centered his entire life in God and God in Him. And He has seen the fruits from all of this. Now that he ha all these fruits has been taken away, it has humbled Him. But it's His true test of faith. I believe He still has faith in His God. He might have lost hope. It says here, my hope has been uprooted like a tree, meaning he has been tested. But he still has faith in his God because he says, but for me, I know my vindicator lives and that he will at last stand forth upon the dust. And from my flesh, I shall see God and my inmost being is consumed with longing, longing for his God. So, this is a very powerful passage here, teaching us that life is real, darkness is real, people hurt, the closest ones that are around you can turn against you. But doesn't mean that you must change your heart. You stay grounded. You stay rooted in your God. It's like you said, the enemy tells you otherwise. The enemy tells you everything that you believe is to be true. <laughs> Somebody hurt me, I must hurt them, Pa. That's not God's way. It's not for our understanding. Nothing that's happening to Job here is to his understanding. He doesn't understand what is happening, but he still has his faith in his God because he knows at the end of the day, God is love, God is good, God knows him. He knows his God. He has been rooted in his God from all his life and done good by God, and God has done good for him. Things are not going his way, but he still knows at the end of the day, things will get better. 
Well, he doesn't know that right now. But, but it will be a test of faith where it shows that at the end of the day, God will see him true. He's believing that God will see him true. He doesn't know what it is. Mm-hmm. But God will be his vindicator. Mm-hmm. God will see him through. And I think that should apply for all our lives. That despite everything you hear of what you should do or shouldn't do when bad comes your way, (laughs) the only person you really need to listen to is your heart and what God tells it. And if you're rooted in your God, it's only good that God will tell you and bring to you. And he brings you the comfort, he gives you the love, he brings you the strength to carry on and move forth. So um, that's my sharing um, for today. Beautiful, Marky. Thank you very much, Marky. Very powerful. A heart humble and contrite, God will save. That's today's response. We must always remember that God allows these battles, these trials to come to us for a reason, whatever it is, you know. So let us never forget that he lives. Amen. I know my Redeemer lives. That's a very powerful line, mm. right? And the song comes from that. So let us have that confidence, whatever we're facing. Remember, we all go through our battles. But whatever we are facing, our Redeemer lives. He will not abandon us. Call out to Him. Spend some time with Him. He won't abandon you. Jesus loves you. And with that, we thank you for joining us today. And we invite you to join us now for our closing prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, Defend, defend us in sense. battle. Be, Be our protection, protection against, against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God, God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who wander throughout the world, seeking the ruins of souls. Amen.